For our first scripture reading of today, I'm going to be reading from Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look o not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Christ Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, Jack, for sharing that passage of Scripture with us, and we'll be looking at uh, several others this morning. It's a privilege to be here. As uh, Chris mentioned earlier, uh, my wife Sarah is here with me, and Mandy and, and her husband Mark from uh, Johnson from our office, our Converge North Central office in, in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And, uh, uh, don't worry, I, I do that sometimes as well. I, you know, last time I was up here was the Minnesota Baptist Conference, and then it was the Minnesota Iowa Baptist Conference, and now we're Converge North Central. And there's all kinds of great reasons why we did all those things together, but that's another day. Today we're here for an installation service. I got a call from uh, Pastor Chris, asked if uh, I'd come up with, uh, to be involved in the installation service uh, here at, at Gloria and Aiken. And, and Chris and I have a little history together. Uh, we we're both from South Dakota. I moved to this position from uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where I pastored a church for, for 19 years. But uh, shy little guy that I am, I knew a bunch of folks in, in uh, South Dakota. And there was uh, a pastor who was a friend and a mentor and, at Northridge in Mitchell, South Dakota, where Chris grew up. And that was John Tom and uh, connected and you know, met Chris at, at that time there. I didn't, didn't see much for a period of time. And then we had a generosity summit at, in Owatonna, Minnesota. And uh, good friend Scott Rideout, who's now our president, came, presented that at uh, generosity summit. And uh, this, this uh, young man shows up for the generosity summit and seemed to know people who interacted together. And sure enough, it was Chris who, who came together at, at that time. So I uh, saw Chris in the flesh there at that meeting and uh, interacted with him, all kinds of questions back and forth. But if you know Chris, I said I saw him in the flesh because he keeps appearing all the time. I won't say constantly, but very often on this uh, little multi, uh, this, this tool called Facebook. Anybody ever on Facebook? Anybody ever see Chris on Facebook? Yeah, anybody see him morning? Anybody see him at noon? Anybody see him at night? I uh, wake up in the morning and there he is again. Fa uh, Chris is on Facebook. You know, he keeps in contact with, with people all over the place. And so these mutual friends and others that uh, interacted with uh, together on, on Facebook. Uh, because of that, one piece of the service or one piece of the charge this morning is going to be something directly from Facebook. Just for you, Chris. But it's for everybody else that, that's coming, uh, coming from that this morning. So I've connected with, with Chris uh, over a number of years. So excited about him being here at Glory in, in Aiken. Uh, he's, he's had a, a heart and a passion not only for Converge, but a heart and a passion for lost people. And so uh, glad for him to be here and for what God has already done, is doing, and will continue to do uh, through the ministry of Glory and under leadership of, of Pastor Chris. Well, this first charge that he asked me to give, he, he said, that's, that's a, uh, two charges, charge to the church and, and, and charge to, to the individual as well. But it's all because of an installation. Now, I got to tell you, when he said, come and do the installation, I wanted to wear my car hearts. You know, you come up for the installation, you throw on the car hearts. My car hearts are brown, and obviously you can see they're not blue. So I couldn't wear my car hearts today for the installation. But if you're going to install something, you need tools. So I brought my toolbox. 
And I figured out walking in from the back of the parking lot, this is a heavy toolbox. Couple tools. In my toolbox here to, to use just a number of, of essentials. If you're going to install something, you've got to have a hammer. This is just a basic tool. It, it, it's used for, for pounding. It's using for, for, used for putting things together. It's used for tearing things apart. You've got to have the right tools. A hammer is a tool that you have to have for installations for, of anything except windows. Screwdrivers. This is a healthy, hardy screwdriver. This is for the big things that, that you do, you, you put in. You've got to have the right tools. You don't want to screw things up. You want to tighten them up. You, you need a screwdriver. Uh, sometimes there's more precise things, and so there's a little more intricate things and intricate adjustments that you need to do. So a small screwdriver. This is one of my favorites. Anybody know what this is called? Wonder Bar. Wonder Bar. They are wonderful. With a Wonder Bar, you can do all kinds of things. If you forgot your hammer, right there. You, you got the hammer on this end. If you've got to pick something up from the ground, you stick that underneath to pick it up. If you've got to carry drywall, you know, it fits right in there. You put your other arm around it, gives you about another foot, and you can carry that around with you. If you need to open something up with this end, Wonder Bar is a wonderful tool used for all kinds of different things. You got to have the right tools to do the proper installation. I won't go through any other tools in the box. There's a lot of them here. Allen wrenches and all those kinds of different things there. Tools are important and necessary for installations. The tool for this particular installation, for what you're going to be doing, for what comes together, the tool is found in God's Word. It's God is. God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the center, the head of the church. And everything follows from what He gives us and the tool that He gives us and the instructions that He gives to us in His Word. So a couple things as a charge to the church. A charge to the church, you're installing today a new blue pastor. First of all is support. Support your pastor. Support your pastor in all kinds of different ways. I want to list s several of them together. Support your pastor by encouraging him. Encourage your pastor. You've all heard the st statistics. You need seven to ten positives for one negative. You know what? It's the church. Wish it wasn't so. But there are negative things that come in the church or through the church. And usually, where do they go first? Well, sometimes they're, they're, there's conversations within the body, but eventually they come to the pastor. Let me encourage you to encourage your pastor. To encourage your pastor with, with a kind word. To encourage your pastor with, with an invitation. To encourage your pastor by, by being present. To, encur to encourage your pastor by saying yes. To encourage your pastor in whatever way that you do that on a regular basis. If that's not a gift of yours, learn how to be an encourager. If you know somebody else who is an encourager, say, how, how do you do that? Ask them, because I want to do that. As a congregation, encourage your pastor. Thirdly, and so support him by praying for him. Pray for your pastor. Pray for his physical needs, pray for his spiritual needs, pray, pray for, for opportunities to share the good news of the gospel. You go through God's word, and one of the things Paul asks for often is pray for me. Pray for me that I would be effective in sharing the good news of the gospel. Pray for me for safety. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. Paul, in the, in the New Testament, talks about shipwrecks. He talks about being in prison. He talks about going to places. He talks about coming up against people, against all kinds of different things. The work of the ministry is prayer. And so let me encourage you to pray for your pastor, to support him by praying for him. Also to support him by following him. By following him. Oftentimes, you'll, you'll come down to decision, a, a decision together. The leadership, of the, t the leadership of the church will work through decisions, they'll work through processes, and they'll set direction individually and collectively. And when those times come, follow your leader. Follow your leader. 
Scripture talks to us about that. I'll read a passage in, in, in Scripture that, in, in just a moment about that. And then, fifthly, honor him. Honor him. A culture of honor. In our African American churches, that's just a culture that has followed, a culture of honor and honoring the pastor in the ways that they, that they, they function, the ways that they serve, and, and places that they serve. But find ways here at Glory to honor your pastor, to honor him in the community, to honor him by, by listening to him, but to honor him by, by sharing with him, to honor him in many, many different ways. Find ways to honor your leader. Support by encouraging, praying for, following, and honoring. Passage of Scripture from 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 to 19 says, says this. Or let's go to 1 Timothy. That's where it says this. 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 19. The elders who address the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But honor, honor your leader, especially the one whose task is preaching and teaching. Give him the time that he needs to study, to learn, to grow, to prepare, so that you prepare as that you are prepared as well. And then from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 8, we read: Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others for, which, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be no advantage to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honorably in every way. I partic particularly urge you to pray so that I may be, may, may be restored to you soon. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with, every good, with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Pray for, honor, obey, follow, that it may go well for you, that it may, well, may go well for this body, that the word of God, the word of Christ, would be proclaimed in a positive, productive way so that people will come to know Jesus Christ. Scriptures tell us, how will people know that we are followers of Christ? By our love for one another. By the way we love demonstrates the gospel to those around us. Would you love in such a way that God's word will go forward in honoring, in honoring his name. I said that uh, for Chris, I had to go, go to Facebook for something just because that's, that's who he is. And so the, about two weeks ago, there, I, I saw something on Facebook that I thought, this is for you, Chris, for the body here at Glory and how and, and, and a charge to the church. Tom Rainier. Tom Rainier is the president of Lifeway uh, 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 Lifeway Resources. He has a, a blog that he writes regularly. And, and this one was 10 ways, 10 simple things that every pastor wants to hear. And he says this. It's a, it's a simple question. What do you hear from church members that gives you the greatest encouragement? The responses from pastors surveyed were amazingly similar. And here's the 10 things that every pastor wants to hear. Number one, I pray for you every day. I pray for you every day. This statement was the most frequent. Read it carefully. It's not just prayer. It's daily prayer. 
The pastor understands that ministry is spiritual warfare. The pastor understands that prayer is one of the greatest weapons in warfare. For you to say, I pray for you daily. Secondly, for you to say, I want to help your family any way I can. I want to help your family any way, any way I can. He says, most pastors are stressed and stretched. So are their families. And when a church member offers to support and help the family, the pastor feels like shouting for joy. Make him shout for joy. Thirdly, I want, I want you to know specifically how God spoke to me through your sermon. The key word here is specifically. I want you to know specifically how God spoke to me through your message. It's not a lot of encouragement if a person says perfunctorily, good sermon, the way out the door, good sermon. Let the pastor know the specific meaning and application to you from the message. Number four, I'm ready and willing to take on that ministry task. Pastors take great joy when a church member understands that ministry is to be done by the members, that the pastor is not the hired hand to do it, but to equip people. We just heard that about eight minutes ago. Chris got up and said, I'm so excited that these two couples are stepping in to help out in the ministry. God's going to be doing some things through that. There are two couples who said, I'm ready and willing to take that ministry task. The responsibility in this end is to do equipping, to come alongside, to prepare. But though there were two families, among many others in this body, who have said yes to ministry. Number five, I see my role as an encourager. For you to say, I see my role as an encourager. Pastors need numbers of people who will take on the Barnabas role because the critics will always be there. Barnabas in the New Testament was the, was the son of encouragement. The minister of encouragement. Be that in the life of your pastor. Number six, I see my role as one who will confront the bullies and the perpetual critics in the church. Tom Rainier says, I've heard from countless pastors that it's not the critics who bother them. It's not the critics who bother them as much as the friends who will not speak up to the critics and church bullies. Honor your pastor by standing up for who he is and confronting things and not just letting things go by. Number seven, I will make certain your family has adequate income. Hebrews talks, about that. Hebrews talks about that. One of the greatest stressors on pastors is financial worry. It's a, a relief and a joy when a church member takes the role of being a financial advocate for the pastor. Encourage him. Pay him. He's worth it. Number seven, I'm available to watch your kids. Pastors with young, young kids relish time together with their spouse. Come alongside, offer to, to take the kids some time to be involved in that way. Number nine, I will be in church with no excuses unless providentially hindered. Anybody have other options on a regular basis to be someplace else on a Sunday? We all do. Commit to being a part of the body and to being there. Excuses are rampant all the time. Opportunities are are. are, are are rampant all the time. But there's something about being together in the house of the Lord together. The psalmist said, I rejoice with, the, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. There's something about being together collectively as a body. Commit to that. And number 10, I will never compare you, my pastor, to a previous pastor. Yep, it's true. Sometimes they're even in the church. <laughs> like, like today. God has blessed you with great leaders over the years. But yeah, pastors cringe when they hear, Pastor Bill used to do it this way, or Pastor somebody else used to do it like that. What about you? Let your pastor know. Let your pastor know that he has his own identity and that previous pastors are not a scorecard against which other things are measured. God has give, gifted this church with great leadership over the years. It's listed for you in your bulletin. And God has blessed this church with a great leader in Chris today. And we're installing him to be used of God in this place at this period of time for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ.
So let that be you as you install Pastor Chris today and as you take steps moving forward. There are some commitments that we're going to make that are up upon up the screen and if you want to come and direct us in that time. Thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. As Pastor Carlson has said, uh, we as a congregation have a responsibility for Pastor Chris's uh, success in, uh, in a pastorate here. And if you look in your bulletins, you will see vows to the congregation. And I believe it's also going to be on the screen. Um, I am going to read the first portion of each segment, and I would like you to respond in the bold print. So either follow along on the screen or in your bulletin, whichever you prefer. But it is something that we as a congregation need to take very seriously. In calling Pastor Chris to be our pastor, we enter into a covenant with God and with Pastor Chris. We will faithfully perform the tasks set before us as God's family and as the congregation of Glory Baptist Church. We will remember these promises. We promise to listen well and to receive God's word as Pastor Chris teaches us. We promise to encourage Pastor Chris and to help him in his work, always lifting him in prayer. We promise to, to do everything we can to grow God's kingdom. We will strive to be the love of Christ in our world. We will be good stewards of all God's gifts to us, including time, talents, and the material resources God provides. We will remember always that as part of the body of Christ, we are connected to one another. There is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God who is Father of all. He is above all, through all, and in us all. May God's blessing be upon us. Now all glory be to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. In my portion here, I'm going to read from John 10, 1 through 18. But before I begin, I just want to, especially with some youth uh, members here, there's a word that I'm going to use here, and the word is sheepfold. Okay? And when I say that word, we're not taking a sheep and physically folding it. What it is in Israel, there were corrals. We'll call them a corral, okay? So at night, the sheep herder had to go to sleep, right? So rather than allowing thieves, um, wolves, other predators to take the sheep, they would put them inside of this corral. But in Israel, wood was sort of a precious commodity, so these corrals were made of stone, okay? The stone was high enough where no predator could get in, a thief or a robber couldn't get in. So the only way in and out was through a gate, okay? I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheepfold, rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep do not, did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, 
and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my father knows me, and I know the father, so the sacrifice... So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too, and they are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to, and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. Thank you, Kevin. And Pastor Chris, just as we had words for the congregation, a charge to the congregation, I want to give a charge to you as well. And I want to share a little bit first, and then I will uh, have you respond to that. So again, just like we have a toolbox, a, a toolbox with tools to, file, to, to, to follow, the tool for pastors to follow is found in God's Word. And sadly today, there are many who don't follow God's Word. They follow all kinds of other things. But we're a church that stands on the Word of God. The song we used to sing in Sunday school is, as kids, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And what we do as leaders needs to be found and structured on God's Word because God's Word is the tool for church leadership but the tool for all of life. And so a charge to you, to you Chris, is to, to follow what God says in His Word. In uh, 2 Timothy, here's the 2 Timothy passage that we want to go to. In 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, uh, and going on to the middle part of, of chapter 4, Paul has a charge to Timothy. And so in, in verses in, in 3.10, it says, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. And yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, as for you, continue, with, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing." First and foremost, preach the word. Preach the word in season and out of season. Be prepared at any time. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to have to get up in the middle of the night and do these things. Work hard. Be diligent at studying God's word, at understanding his word. Set aside the time so that you have a word to say, a word from God. And those words from God are based on two things. 
And don't lose that. They're based on the great commandment and the great commission. In Matthew, in, in, in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 22, in Matthew 22, is, uh, the elders and, and, and teachers of the law were, were, ta- were trying to distract Jesus to, to trip him up. And they asked him, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Don't let those things depart from your mind. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Because when you get the love thing right, you get it all right. And that's the world in which we live. And then Matthew chapter 28, what's going to help in that is the Great Commission. When Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus Christ has promised that he will never leave you, that he will never forsake you. So never forget the great commandment or the great commission because when we, are, when we do those things, Scripture tells us that all of the law and the prophets are summed up in those two things. Love God. Love others with all of your heart. But for that to happen, let me give you one more charge, Chris. One more charge, and it's charged from the Old Testament and from the New Testament. It comes from Proverbs 4.23. It says, Above all else, Guard your heart, for from it flow the wellsprings of life. Above all else, guard your heart. That's taking care of yourself, taking care of who you are, taking care of of being attentive to God's word. Guarding your heart. Above all else, guard your heart, for from it flow the wellsprings of life. Your joy, your passion, your heart for people, everything will flow out of your heart. So guard that with everything you have because it's going to affect what comes forward. A very similar thing from Philippians. From Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 9, just a couple passages or a couple of chapters beyond what, what Jack read. In verses 4 to 9 of, of Philippians chapter 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, catch this, it will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. God will do that. You guard it, but trust him. Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Guard your heart. Think on God's word. Let it permeate your thoughts. Let it permeate the things that you do. Seek Him. And God will help you guard your heart and mind and give you peace. We've both been around the block enough to know that God's peace in phenomenal measures is what directs us and moves us forward. We've both seen enough things to know that It's an unpeaceful world. It's an unsettling place. But God calls us to step in. And it's an amazing thing that we get to be the peace in the presence of God in a wide range of settings. Not because of anything we've done. Not because of who we are. Not because of anything else except the peace and the presence and the power of God. And we get to represent that. So never forget the great commandment or the great commission, or to guard your heart as you seek to serve and to lead in your own life, in your home, and in the church as the man of God that he's called you to be. I look forward to seeing what God's going to continue to do through you, Chris.
And so Kevin, come and give us a charge to the pastor that we can co- that he can commit to. Pastor Chris, do you believe that you are truly called by God to do this ministry in this church? Indeed, I do so believe. Do you enter into this ministry because of your passion to glorify God, because of your love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and because you want to share his love and grace with all persons? As far as I know my own heart, I do. Will you diligently read and study God's word and other studies that will help you apply God's truths to the lives of those committed to your care? With God's help, I will. Following the example of the great shepherd, will you minister to God's people in every circumstance, identifying with their joys and sorrows and giving special care to the sick, grieving, and disheartened? With God's help, indeed, I will. Will you help your people to be good stewards of God's many gifts so each of us is equipped for the work of ministering and so the congregation is built up in love? With God's help, I will. Will you lead a prayerful and disciplined life, remembering your responsibilities as a Christian husband, father, and as a pastor of this body of Christ that you were called to serve? With God's help, I indeed will. Pastor Chris, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. Together, we pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. At this time, we'll have the uh, prayer team and we'll do the prayer installation. Father, how thankful we are to be here this day for this service, for Pastor Chris and his family, and we praise you. We praise you for all the good that you have done and are doing and will continue to do in this church and in Chris and Kim and Justice. We praise you for the responsibility that we have as a church and the strength and the grace that you're going to give us, Lord. Now we just lift up Pastor Chris and his family to you. We just praise you for them. We praise you for bringing them here to our church, and we ask that you would bless them. Bless them and overflow them with your spirit. May they increase and abound in love for you and for this church and for the lost through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that by your grace that they could fight the good fight of faith, that they would be surrounded by prayer by your mighty angels to protect them and by your people to support them and love them and encourage them. And I pray that they would be strong and bold and courageous in their faith to speak truth, to reprove and rebuke and encourage and exhort in due time and good season, that they would be strong in your word and that they would be faithful um, each and every day looking to you for the grace and the strength that they need to continue to um, follow and endure and run this race that you've set before them, Jesus. Father, we use the words that you gave Paul in Ephesians, and so we pray for this reason, because we've heard of the faith of Pastor Chris and Kim and Justice in the Lord Jesus and their love toward all the saints. We do not cease to give thanks for them, remembering them in our prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you, having the eyes of their hearts enlightened, that they may know what is the hope to which you have called them, 
what are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of your power toward us who believe, according to the working of your great might, that you worked in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And Father, we thank you that as we come today, we as a congregation are not ceasing to pray for Pastor Chris and Kim and Justice, rather that we would uphold our part as we charge to them that you will fill them with the knowledge of your will and in all spiritual um, knowledge and understanding. We just thank you that they will be walking in the manner in which you will guide them. And we pray that as we go forth today that we would be able to use this this blessing on Chris and Kim and Justice, and that is this, that they will be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified them to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm allowed to give a response, but I will be brief. I am uh, humbled and thankful and rejoice that I get to do what it is I get to do. I feel that uh, joy of serving alongside of each and every one of you. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to have gotten to know many of you over the last few months as we've been slowly acclimating ourselves to the Aiken community. Uh, for those who are visitors, it, it was a process. I started here in late January. Uh, my family moved here officially uh, at the end of May. And so it's, it's been an ongoing process, but it's been a wonderful process. If you saw the article in the newspaper, as I mentioned, it's really been a tremendous blessing to have so many people here who have such a servant heart. And uh, I'm going to take advantage of that, not in a bad way, but in a holy way. I intend to do great things. You know, I desire to spread the gospel throughout this region in tremendous and amazing ways. To build upon those who've come before us, who've left a wonderful legacy, who've provided us with a tremendous facility, who've given us all sorts of gifts and resources that we might continue down this path sharing God's glory with all that we may come into contact with. As Dan said, the, the Great Commission uh, the greatest commandment. Those, those two things are where my heart lies. Um, to tell people about the love of Jesus and then to love them and love them well. And so that excites me. That, that helps me get up every morning. I look forward to doing that. I look forward to doing that with you. I look forward to equipping you for that, that we might make a difference. And I truly believe that God has brought all of you here for that purpose. And so, as I said, I look forward to serving with you, alongside of you, and equipping you for the years to come, and just seeing what amazing things that God will do. May we all look back and say, clearly, without God, that could have never happened. That is my joy, and that is my goal. So, thank you for being part of that adventure and journey, and I look forward for what God will do for all of us in the days, weeks, and months to come. Well, with that, I am going to offer a prayer. Uh, we will have a closing song sung, and then uh, we're going to go out and live this out in the world. So let us pray. God, you are indeed good, and we thank you for this time that we have had together this morning, Lord. Lord, you have begun a good work, and we know that in and through you, you will see it to completion. Pray, God, for those who are here today and those who are going to be coming in the time to come, that truly, God, all of us may be parts of the body. None of us on our own can do all of the work that you have intended for this church, and you have brought each and every one of us here for a purpose. I do not think it's by mistake. And so, Lord, whether we're a hand, a foot, an eye, an ear, whatever it is that we make up in the body, may we do that part well. May we do it to your glory. May we do it to spread your name and your fame here locally, and to the ends of the earth. 
So God, as we finish this beautiful time we've had of worship today, we thank you for your blessing, and we pray that as we go forth, we would go forth with your encouragement, taking it wherever we go, as salt and light. We love you, we thank you and praise you, in Jesus' name, amen.